The information presented in this video is certainly the stuff of science fiction. But the question is, is there or has there ever been science fiction? Could it be that the science fiction writers of yesteryear and today are simply in the know of future plans of suppressed technology now in the hands of certain secretive agencies? Famous science fiction writers of the past, such as Robert Heinlein, H.G. Wells, and Aldous Huxley, were certainly insiders that might have known the intricacies of what the true state of science fact was. Did these science fiction writers from the past or science fiction producers of the present day like George Lucas or Steven Spielberg simply relate, in a fictional format, science or future plans hidden from the general public and pass it off as fantasy? Answers to these questions and many others might come from the research done and comments made by Alfred Lambermann Weber. Dr. Weber is a graduate of Yale University and Yale Law School in International Law and was a Fulbright Scholar in International Economic Integration in Uruguay. He's taught economics at Yale University and constitutional law at the University of Texas. Alfred was general counsel to the New York City Environmental Protection Administration, a futurist at Stanford Research Institute, Incidentally, where he directed the proposed 1977 Carter White House Extraterrestrial Communications Study. Alfred was also an NGO delegate to the United Nations and the Unispace Conference, and as a judge on the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal. Dr. Weber is also the author of Exopolitics, Politics, Government, and Law in the Universe a book that founded the field of exopolitics, which is the science of relations among intelligent civilizations in the multiverse. On an interview done for Volcano Radio, Alfred discusses the realities of time travel. I know that these are kind of hard concepts to explain, so I hope that I can... One of my tasks has been to report and in some part to be what we call enmeshed in the secret time travel and teleportation programs of the United States and what I would really call the matrix government of the planet. And they have operated on the basis of using secret time travel and teleportation technology to govern the planet politically for at least the last 40 years. And people can go to exopolitics.com and on the right hand menu, there's a link that says time travel and teleportation and click there and you'll see a whole raft of links to articles that explain this and give all the sources articles like time travel and political control that explain how the matrix authorities that have control of political of time travel technology travel to the future obtain information and then control us politically on the basis of that information by pre-identifying future presidents prime ministers and then co-opting them 20 years in advance and then grooming them as secret CIA or secret MI5 or MI6 operatives so that what you think is a president or a prime minister is really almost a lifelong operative. What occurred to me is that in real time in 1999 I wrote a book called Exopolitics, which established the science of exopolitics, which is the science of relations among intelligent civilizations in the multiverse. And it was published in the year 2005. Well, what occurred, unknown to me, was that the CIA and DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, time travel that book from at least 2005 back to at least 1971 and I was told this in 2005 by a project participant 
in the Secret Time Travel Project, who had seen it in 1971 in person, Lieutenant Commander Andrew D. Bashago in the U.S. Navy. And so in 1971, at the time that it was time traveled back to and that this whistleblower had seen it, I was general counsel of the Environmental Protection Administration of, of New York City. And part of my job was to speak to the public in New York about protecting the environment, the air quality, water quality, noise abatement, things of, things of this sort. And one day I was asked to speak at this organization. I said, fine. And what was different about it is when the person came to pick me up, he was not uh, a student or a housewife that tended to be the environmentalist. He was a man dressed in a suit and very formal. And we traveled for about two hours and I, I arrived at this nondescript office building and there were 50 other men in suits. And I instantly knew through my double vision <laughs> right. that these were not environmentalists. These looked like government op operatives. These looked like spooks, uh, we call them. Spooks. Yeah, spooks. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I kind of stayed in character and gave my standard environmental stump speech. But they were sort of smirking at me and I could tell that they knew about something about me that I didn't know and, and that they were surveying me and a number of them were smirking at me trying to get me off game. But I just, you know, soldiered on and, and at the end of it, they applaud me and gave me a, a mug, which, which I put, I, I brought back to my office. It said Delaware Valley Industrial Engineering Association. Now I searched for that and no such association exists. So in 2005, Andrew D. Bishago told me this and we both we, we both put together that that was a room full of CIA and Department of Defense officials who had my book that they had time traveled back, back from 2005. They may also have been carrying out real time time travel surveillance on me, either by chronovisor, which is like either a 2D or 3D television screen, which they tune into any time space coordinates a b c d e and they just tune in and they just follow what you're doing they had been surveying me in in time and space in the future and they knew that i would be in in the future revealing many of their state secrets now here's the question they, for you based on that yeah. and i won't interrupt you too many times there, but it might have some sort of adverse effect on events to come is it risky was it risky by them to do that? There are certain constraints of what we call time science. And so all of their technology and all of the movements have to operate within the rules of time science. And so that's, so that's how the time science, that's how all of the time travel systems operate within the constraints of time, of time science so as not to be a disruptive force. And that's one of the principal reasons why this technology has to be made public and brought under public controls, because otherwise it could be turned, as you just suggested, into a weapon. Of course, because you could, um, well, well there, there are financial things you could do. You could go back and you could speculate on certain things because you know you know what what's what's happening in the markets at the very least you could go back and start betting on nba championships and super bowl championships and all sorts of stuff like that and uh yes. en enhance yourself in in the future alfred it's got amazing implications you know yes yes one of the one of the um i i've spoken to at least six uh whistleblowers from the top secret u.s time travel and teleportation program one of whom was a U.S. presidential advisor to a president, and he's an extraordinary man. And what he told me, for example, was that the reason why U.S. President Nixon was taken out of office, 
the the kind of the cover story was was Watergate, but it was because he was objecting to all of the excesses and financial speculation and money laundering that personnel and factions within the CIA were using in the time travel and teleportation program in secret. And that's why the CIA set him up in Watergate and took him out. So that's some of the behind the scenes history that is very much different from what we're fed in public. And I must just mention now, for in, in case some of our listeners are on teleportation, it's the idea is that I can walk through a door here in Manchester and instantaneously come out another door in Florida, right alongside Alfred, basically. That's, that, well, that's the it, essence, is it, or am I wrong in saying that? Well, it, it probably, it would be about three or four minutes, or yeah, yeah, maybe less. But but that's but but that's the basic idea. To those of us here, as a matter of public policy, and this this would have happened. And in fact, one of my colleagues, again, the whistleblower Andrew D. Bishago, Bishago yeah. one of his jobs in the program back in 1971 was to routinely go to a DARPA forward time base in the year 2045. We're now in 2014. But by 2045, teleportation along that timeline was a fairly common thing. This has many advantages. Number one, it eliminates all forms of pollution from fossil fuel. Right now we're pushing around you know, 4,000 pounds of steel that you wrap around your waist in order to go to the corner to pick up a bottle of milk. So that is one of the most inefficient forms of transportation around. Plus, you've got all of the concrete in roads, in highways, all of the land use in trains. Uh, Jane Jacobs writes about how all of the cities have been destroyed by rail yards and by highways and overpasses. So by switching out of the fossil fuel and intercombustion world, we move away from this gross use of land use, gross misuse of land use and polluting technology to a non-polluting technology. And we bring back and bring back to life all of the inner cities. He said that there the teleportation units were built into the walls and you would go up to a wall, dial up to where you wanted to go, and then you would be taken there. This is a goal that we are pushing now for the release of these teleportation technologies and to move beyond the fossil fuel world. And the only reason that they're not is that Donald H. Rumsfeld back in 1971-72, who was a member of the Richard Nixon cabinet, as well as Henry Kissinger, who was the national security advisor, said that this is going to be maintain a military secret so that the United States can deliver its troops to the battlefield by teleportation anywhere around the world it wants to. Alfred, I was coming to that. I was just going to say that to you. That would be uh, one of the most important applications for them, wouldn't it? That's all they would yeah. think about. Yeah, we can get armies yeah. overseas in four minutes. Bang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and this would virtually transform our world into a paradise planet. You would have no longer have oil world, uh, oil wars. You would get rid of a major source of pollution, which is fossil fuel. Look at, look at what China's bringing on, online now with the coal with all of these new energy sources that are what we call quantum access. This is accessing the quantum of energy of these new Tesla based energy sources. And the, and and there's no reason for these military intelligence agencies to hang on to these secrets, which they have for over 40 years because it's killing the planet and it's killing humanity and there are minority factions that want to do that, want to kill the surface 
dwelling humans, they, they call them surface dwellers, and then supplant the surface dwellers with a gene pool Mars colony that they've been developing on Mars of elite humans with super, superior DNA that they'll just bring on after they've gotten rid of us all surface dwellers. And I think that just yesterday, a woman came forward uh, with a leak. She was a former NASA employee who saw back in 1979, a person walking around on Mars. Of course, the, the US and the UK have had bases on Mars and personnel on Mars at the elite level since at least the 1960s. Alfred characterizes a control system striving through all means possible to maintain its hold over humanity. These controllers appear to be using technology far beyond that which the average human conceives as possible. In considering such notions that stretch our reality, it's important not only to consider the source and the information, but also take into account the confined nature of what we've been taught is possible taught incidentally by the control system itself. Could it be that we've been trapped in a matrix reality constructed to limit our conceptualization of what's possible? Could this have been done to elicit an automatic reaction of disbelief to any data that conflicts with the reality taught in schools and then reinforced by the media? Is science fiction a mechanism to categorize ideas into what is fact and what is fantasy? Could it be an instrument designed to teach us what to believe and what to disbelieve, thereby enabling the controllers to hide advanced technology, technology which they use to maintain control, and then hide it in plain sight? Certainly we are schooled to the notion that we live in a physical reality governed by the laws of Newtonian science. But this notion defines a particularly rigid set of parameters for what is feasible, for what is real. Cemented in the notion of physicality, we are incapable of grasping anything outside of a seemingly material world. Could this be the controller's greatest tool of suppression? Denying us the knowledge of who we are? what we are, and the rules that govern the omniverse? This confines us in a prison without bars, a narrow range of possibilities outside of which the controllers can operate with impunity. Without being able to break free from the stunted vision of what's achievable, we remain ensnared in a slave-like existence, subject to the horrors, isolation, separation, wars, and limitations which they choose for us. Later in the interview, Dr. Weber reconceptualizes a reality, a reality in which many more possibilities abound, and perhaps freedom from the matrix can be found. Is time a construct? Well, it's a dimension. We now live in what's called a time-space hologram. We are inside a virtual reality. It's like if we're inside the virtual reality that you yourself would watch through a pair of Google glasses. And people can read my most recent book called The Dimensional Ecology of the Omniverse. It's the uh, product of five years research that was started by a request from Oxford, from Oxford University Press, which is a division of Oxford. And it's perfectly scientifically, all of the evidence there is based on replicable scientific experiments. What we are in now, yourself as Richie, myself as Alfred, we can call ourselves avatars. All of us humans, all of those listening to this program, all of us 7 billion on this planet, what we are is we are time-space avatars inside of a time-space virtual reality that's a time-space hologram where time 
is one of the dimensions. It's composed of multiple timelines. The good news is this, that as of December 21st, 2012, the holographic timeline that humanity has been on has shifted from, I would call, a duality consciousness-based timeline in which you can call a catastrophic timeline to a positive timeline. And that's why all these end-of-the-world scenarios have not occurred and why all the false flags that they're trying to get off the ground, like World War III, they don't have traction for because as of December 21st, 2012, the, the portal, the interdimensional portal at the core of our universe has started to broadcast waves of unity consciousness, which is we are one. Duality consciousness is I win, you lose. And that's what the matrix has been operating under. And as of December 21st, 2012, it shifted to unity consciousness. So any plans, organization, attempts, thoughts, you know, that are trying to impose du duality consciousness will not prosper. And individuals, thoughts, organizations that are in unity consciousness gain traction on this new holographic timeline. The other good news is that this being a virtu virtual reality, and I being the avatar Alfred, you being the avatar Richard, R Richie, we have our seven billion fellow avatars here. Each of us is co connected to a non-local soul, which is based in what we call the interlife dimension. That soul can be leading multiple lives in multiple virtual realities, not only as humans, but they can be le leading it as, as intelligent fish or other forms. So this is a very advanced form. And what souls do in the interlife also between lives is that they have very important functions co-creating the universes that they incarnate into. There's a recent paper by two scientists at Stanford showing that they were asked how many universes are, are there in the multiverse? And the response was, there are so many, it's humongous. And the human mind can't even comprehend, but if you went to write that number out in 12-point type, that number would be more than 260 million miles long. Wow, that's that's many yeah. universes there are in the multiverse. So we are in a hum in a humongous in a humongous reality, each of which had contained so many intelligent civilizations that we couldn't comprehend how many. Basically, this is a this is a spiritual, I would call it uh, a struggle or a war between matrix forces who want to keep as many souls from moving up in density of consciousness, from being trapped in, let's say, lower third density where they are now, and moving up the ladder of consciousness where they where they would no longer be subject to. And so money was actually invented as a form of control. It's a form of control that if you, if, if you research it, it goes back to the temples of Babylon and even before where it was used by the Mardukian priests as a, where they would re require it as payment for sex with the temple priestesses slash prostitutes where the farmers would bring in their grain. And so it's been mixed up with concepts of God, sex, money, prostitution, and, and it's a form of imprisonment. And as we know from near death experiences, one can't take money with you. You can't take things with you. All you can take with you is knowledge and experience and karma. Yeah. <laughs> so 
that's that's where one should concentrate one's one's energy during life. You see, at this time is the coming together of spirituality and science. And this is kind of the culmination of this play, right? Because we are on a timeline that has a script. We're inside a virtual reality. To put it simply plainly, we're inside a video game. It's like you came in, you you have your uh, pound or, you know, whatever it is, and, and you put it in there and you're playing the video game called life, right? And now we're coming to the culmination of that video game. And at the video game, everybody gets to know everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so one of the purposes that I wrote Omniverse now is that it uses science and it lets everybody know everything. So it's all out there. It's, it's all there to be known now. There, there are no, see, with the new timeline, with the new unity consciousness, the old program of I win, you lose, which is what the Illuminati banked on under the old game. What happened is that on December 21st, 2012, they changed video games. <laughs> well, look, there, everybody who, who in, who has incarnated now actually signed on for this they fought for these places so now why it's so difficult is because they're competing with their own soul within their own consciousness and minds between the grasp of the illuminati program which is you know listen to us sensation program, war, disease, crime, and poverty, sex cells, materialism, fear, and they're just com trying to let go within themselves of the programming of the old timeline and just try, you know, Armageddon is within. So they, they signed up for this and it's their inner process. And so that's what makes it so neat. There is no doubt that we are living in a time of great opportunity and challenge on the planet. Consciousness wants to shift to a higher level of operation. One of light and love instead of our current state of darkness and fear. It's unlike any other time in history. And we are certainly privileged to be incarnate during this period when this massive change is underway. It is a time of expanding consciousness. A time of opening our hearts and minds to ideas that we never thought possible. Such as time travel, teleportation, and life on nearby planets. A major trap that prolongs the existence of duality consciousness in ourselves and in society in general is our believing in and adherence to the matrix created and controlled consensual reality. This reality describes a physical world of lack with humans competing with one another for scarce resources. It embodies the win-lose mentality of the old timeline, where survival of the most ruthless, the most uncaring, is a fact of life. This materialistic worldview enshrines the individual ego, its enhancement, and the accumulation of money and status as the only worthwhile human endeavor. Success at all costs is the credo in this crumbling reality. This system lacks a concrete morality, and whatever actions are necessary to enhance the success of the ego are acceptable, even if those actions damage others, the environment, or mankind in general. It also dictates strict conformance to social norms and severe punishment for those straying outside of the parameters of what is acceptable behavior or acceptable thought Enslavement by the monetary system and fear of violence keeps this reality in place. This is the control matrix of the old timeline at its essence. 
Lurking just outside of this core structure is what is known as the margins. The mind control system of the matrix allows for thoughts and ideas to stray from the core into the margins to give the illusion of freedom of thought. Marginal subjects are items like veganism, organic gardening, and some alternative healing techniques and other ideas that won't affect the existence of the status quo or interfere with the profitability of a corporate endeavor, such as the pharmaceutical industry. Ideas may move from the margins to the core consensual reality and back to the margins, based upon the whims of the controllers and the corporate goals of the matrix. The forbidden zone is called the fringe. It is in this area where human consciousness can expand to what is possible and create new neural pathways to enhance learning and growth. Alfred was talking about fringe subjects, subjects of which knowledge is forbidden and thought is considered frivolous, if not ridiculous. It is into the fringe that we must venture to expand our knowledge and therefore foster the expansion of consciousness. Forbidding fringe knowledge keeps us trapped and will prolong the win-lose mentality, violence and separation of the duality consciousness. As Alfred states in his interview, on the new positive timeline, all will be known. But is this the cause or the effect of the shift of consciousness? Will all be known because this new timeline is unfolding? Or will the new timeline be facilitated by our individually and collectively exploring the fringe and finding out what's really happening? Logically, it will be a combination of both. Change will be facilitated by our exploration of what is possible, by exploring the fringe, and also by knowledge spontaneously emerging from behind the veil. We simply must be open to ideas outside of the trap of consensual reality. The bottom line is, don't be afraid of the fringe. Explore it. Play with it. Discard its ideas if found to be incorrect, and build on its ideas if they have validity. To be compatible with the new unity consciousness, you must have an open mind, capable of forging new neural pathways from new concepts to produce new ideas and solutions. But follow the fringe. This is where the expansion of consciousness resides. It is where our positive future lies.